Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur back again to help out Cindy Lincoln, again. So far a lot of her presentation has been looking at art from the past and saying it looks like a dinosaur, even though it doesn't, and occasionally looking at modern art that definitely depicts dinosaurs, albeit inaccurately, and then saying that it's ancient. But before we see what else we can help her with, I want to remind you to please like this video and leave a comment when you finish watching it, to let me know what you thought. And if you're not subscribed, please take a second to hit that subscribe button just below this video and remember to use the bell to turn on notifications so you're always alerted when there's new Dapper Dino content. Without further ado, here's Cindy. We want you to put them together with Presto Changeo. All God's creatures lived together in a beautiful paradiso garden, if that's a word, paradise garden, with humans. I look forward to having Ms. Lincoln present Kent's evidence for that. When we're looking at the variety of created animals, a point we brought out before was something known as irreducible complexity, okay? That means you cannot reduce these things. So they can't be partially evolved, okay? All these creatures, this is a beautiful display of donated models that shows everything that they're made of. But the problem with irreducible complexity is that it isn't a barrier for evolution. The definition of irreducible complexity that Michael Behe gives is, quote, an irreducibly complex evolutionary pathway is one that contains one or more unselected steps, that is, one or more necessary but unselected mutations. The degree of irreducible complexity is the number of unselected steps in the pathway, end quote. But the problem there is that it means you can't identify irreducibly complex structures, since you can't know ahead of time if their evolution involved unselected steps. An actually useful definition comes from William Dembski, who says that an irreducibly complex system is, quote, A system performing a basic function is irreducibly complex if it includes a set of well-matched, mutually interacting, non-arbitrary, individuated parts such that each part in the set is indispensable to the maintaining of the system's basic, and therefore original, function. The set of these indispensable parts is known as the irreducible core of the system." Unquote. The problem is that these systems can and do evolve. One of my favorite examples is the one given to me by Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal. It's the VPU protein of HIV-1 group M. In this group of viruses, the VPU protein has developed a new active site within the last century that allows it to antagonize human tetherin, an immune system protein that normally would prevent HIV infection from taking hold. This active site requires four specific mutations that work, and without any of them, it can't antagonize tetherin, and the virus can't spread in humans. See Dan's video above for a more in-depth explanation, but we also know other allegedly irreducibly complex systems can evolve, such as the bacterial flagellum, mammal blood clotting, the eye, etc. So if you take out just one of those parts, if you take out one bone or one organ, the creature is going to die. Well, yeah, all of these now quite derived and specialized organisms need their vital parts. But the thing is, you can find an organism out there that's missing any of these things and doing just fine. For example, sea lancelets do just fine without limbs. Flatworms do fine without respiratory systems. Cave fish do just fine without eyes. Sauropods did just fine without finger bones. Humans do just fine without tails. Coral do just fine without blood. Flies do fine with a heart but without veins and arteries. But once the system develops, it can later become vital to that organism. That doesn't mean it had to start that way. Okay, think about this. What about a blood vessel with no blood? What evolved first, the blood vessel or the blood? The blood. And we know this because many organisms today have what is called an open circulatory system, with or without hearts. Simple organisms like flatworms can get by without any real circulatory system. They just have fluids sloshing around. Organisms like arthropods get by with blood-like fluid called hemolymph that they pump around with a heart, but they don't have a network of veins and arteries like a human. Finally, we get to vertebrates like you and me. We have blood vessels to direct the blood to specific areas, so we know that blood vessels are less important than blood. Therefore, it's pretty easy to see which one would evolve first, and fortunately, we have examples of animals that don't have much in the way of blood vessels, but that do have blood. They had to be simultaneously created and instantly together. 
The continued existence of flatworms and arthropods seems to indicate otherwise. Okay, so all these creatures we believe are just coming from the mind of the Lord. He invented them, created them, and poof, made them. He's not only ingenious, he's powerful, okay? Now, I'm not going to argue that God didn't create these animals. I'm just pointing out that these attempts to discredit evolution fail. If someone wants to take the position that evolution is indicated by the evidence, and there is not a particular reason from science to reject it, but they do anyway because they prefer to believe in a miracle that just looks like evolution, I can't really argue against that scientifically. I have some philosophical objections, but that's not what the channel is really about. When you talk about things evolving, uh, there's really no evidence that no matter how similar they look, like look, these all look similar, right? But there actually are no missing links. Well, the phrase missing link is unfortunate, because if we find it, it's not missing anymore, and it implies that these links are typically missing at all levels of taxonomy, which is not the case. That's why I prefer the term transitional species, even though that also has some problems, but they are fewer. Let's look at some transitional organisms. We have Tiktaalik, which is transitional between basal lobe fin fish and tetrapods. We have Protoceratops, which is transitional between basal marginal cephalians and neoceratopsians. We have a whole host of transitional hominins between basal apes and modern humans. We have Probanagnathus, which is transitional between basal therapsids and mammals. And we have many more. We have transitional monotremes, transitional snakes, transitional mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, whales, birds, carnivorans, even toad ungulates, odd toad ungulates, elephants, bees, ants, scorpions, spiders, etc, etc, etc. Basically, I could do multiple feature-length videos just about transitional forms. This is Stephen Gould. He's a very famous evolutionist. He's claiming the whole chain is missing. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. There are a couple problems here. First, this is a quote mine, and the words missing between for and evolution are gradualistic accounts of. Gould here is complaining that gradualism would predict more transitionals that we find, and that was one of his reasons for suggesting punctuated equilibria, in which new species arrive relatively rapidly, and so we shouldn't expect to see many transitions between closely related species. Also, Gould didn't live to see many of the transitional forms we now have, and he was also aware of many transitional forms, such as Eohippus and Archaeopteryx. There's another one up here. There. This is by Dr. Colin Patterson, who is in charge of the British Museum of Natural History. Okay, it's a museum, they have tons of fossils. He wrote a book about fossils. And somebody wrote him a letter and said, if you're writing a book about fossils, why are there no transitional ones? And the guy actually admits, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. This is a guy whose job is fossils. Yup, this is another quote mine. And one from a personal letter, so not something that is easily checked. Nevertheless, we are indebted to Lionel Thunison, sorry if I mispronounced that, for doing a whole lot of legwork on this one, including reading the revised book Evolution by Dr. Patterson, as well as trying to write to get the full text of the letter from the creationist publishing this quote. They refused to give it to him, which is contrary to academic standards of openness and honesty, so he eventually wrote to Dr. Patterson himself, who confirmed that he did not mean that there were no transitional fossils, instead simply that none of them could for sure be said to be ancestors of modern groups rather than a side branch with no descendants. In fact, in the book itself, Patterson lists and talks about quite a few transitional fossils. He just doesn't make the claim that a particular fossil taxa is necessarily directly ancestral to any modern extant organisms. Further, this quote is inaccurate according to Dr. Patterson, who says it should be read, If I knew of any fossil or living for which an airtight case could be made, he included this part to indicate that we cannot be certain if a form is directly ancestral or not. When you hear Richard Dawkins and all these other guys saying, there is just so much evidence, so many fossils, you can't even list them. Actually, this guy says there's not one. But unfortunately, Cindy has been lied to about the contents of that letter and the position of Dr. Patterson. 
who has complained about creationists misrepresenting him, and doing so without reading the book in question. Every fossil that you find is a complete animal. It maybe look um, similar to another animal, but it doesn't mean they changed one to another. Well, of course, there is no such thing as a half-formed animal. Evolution doesn't predict such things. But there are simple animals, like coral or flatworm, who lack many of the organs that animals like humans or a dinosaur would have. And we have transitions between fully formed animals that are themselves fully formed animals. This is one of the resources we recommend that talks about how every creature had to be abruptly created, fully formed. Okay, the subtitle here says, Explosive Origin of Animal Life, and the Case for Intelligent Design. I can't really debunk that whole book in this series. I'll put a link to Jackson Wheat's excellent video on the Cambrian Explosion, and if Cindy has more questions, she can ask me and we can talk about that. Now, in the science books, they actually use two terms that are very similar to this, um, explosive origin, okay? The Cambrian Explosion is something that scientists admit to. During what they call the Cambrian era, life from non-life just exploded into the fossil record. This is incorrect. The fossil record of life extends back some 3 billion years. The Cambrian started some 540 million years ago, so life had already been around for just under 2.5 billion years before the Cambrian. That's a lot of time for evolution. There was no transition from an amoeba, there were just all these varied life forms suddenly appeared. They use um, the word abrupt appearance. This may have been accurate in about the 1970s, but we now know of plenty of Precambrian organisms that are transitional in nature leading up to the Cambrian, including things that look like they could be prototypical of arthropods, mollusks, and perhaps cnidarians. The Cambrian is now known to simply be a continuation of trends that started before it, such as trends towards more locomotion, as well as more predation, and more need to fend off predators, which in turn led to the development of hard parts, which fossilize more easily. Also, the amoeba talking point is one of Kent's oldest and least correct. I don't blame Cindy for repeating it, as she clearly got it from Kent, and was not in a position to easily fact check him. Nor did she likely see much need to do so to her then partner. But it has never been the consensus of evolutionary biology that the amoeba is ancestral to animals. It is the consensus view that amoebas are a sister group to obozoa, which includes animals, fungi, and certain single-celled organisms. So, whenever Kent says that animals are descended from amoebas, it's sort of like saying a person is descended from his fourth cousin. It's really not true. Everything abruptly appeared. There are no transitional forms. Here are some transitional forms from the Ediacaran to Cambrian animals. After this, Cindy recommends Creation Magazine, but doesn't really give any arguments, so I won't address that except to say that I do not recommend that publication. She also talks about Darwin Devolves by Michael Behe, but really only as a segue to talk about Darwin's finches. So here is Darwin's finches. This is supposedly what he decided proved evolution. I think it's unfortunate that not just in creationism, but in the general field of science communication, that so much weight is put on these birds in terms of the evidence that Darwin put forth in his Origin of Species. They were significant, but so is biogeography of islands and his own breeding experiments, as well as records of breeding in both plants and animals. Basically, the finches inspired him and are a fun example, but they are really not necessary to his overall argument. Rather, they are illustrative. He saw that on different islands, under different conditions, the beaks changed. He said, see, things are changing. However, you'll notice they are still finches. Right, as required by evolution. Evolution is all about ancestry. Now I'm sure that Cindy's mother had a mother who had a mother who had a mother. This woman would be Cindy's great-great-grandmother. Now that makes her a descendant of that woman. Now I don't know if Cindy has children or not, but let's just assume that she does for the sake of the argument. That woman, Cindy's great-great-grandmother, is her children's great-great-great-grandmother. And if her children have children, then they will still have that same woman as their ancestor. As long as Cindy's line does not go extinct, all the people in it will have that woman as an ancestor. That's also how evolution works. If your ancestry includes finches, then you are a finch, and you always will be. A nice way, I think, to illustrate this is to look forward in time to a hypothetical future. 
One of my favorite examples of such is a project called Serena, the World of Birds. I made a video about that, which is by far my most viewed video, but here I'll just show some pictures and link to that video. You see, on the fictional moon Serena, a population of canaries was released, and were the only terrestrial vertebrates on the planet. Over the course of hundreds of millions of hypothetical years, they evolved into myriad forms that you're seeing on screen now. But fundamentally, they are all canaries. They can't stop being canaries, because that's what their ancestors were. Now as we look back in time, let's take a look at Darwin's finches again. They're technically not finches, but tanagers, the so-called New World finches. They are related to true finches, because both are what's called passeroid birds. That is, basically, they're both songbirds. And according to evolutionary theory, their most recent common ancestor would be a passeroid bird. But it wouldn't be a true finch or a tanager, but as the original population of passeroid birds diverged and diversified, new subgroups grew up such as finches, tanagers, sparrows, cardinals, etc. But they never stopped being passeroid birds. Similarly, when some ancestral tanagers found themselves on the Galapagos Islands and then diversified into new species, those new species of necessity remained tanagers. This in evolutionary biology is called the law of monophyly. Essentially, it's just a formalization of the fact that you can't outgrow your ancestry. Your ancestors will always be your ancestors. They're not changing into seagulls or any other kind. Right, and if they did, it would be a big step towards disproving evolution. Because even if a finch evolved to be an omnivorous soaring seabird, it wouldn't be a seagull. It would be an oddball finch. Microevolution does not prove macroevolution. Microevolution is just evolution below the species level. So it is evolution that has not resulted in a new species. Macroevolution is evolution at or above the species level and is the result of a lot of microevolution. Darwin's finches are in fact an example of macroevolution. Now I know Kent doesn't like these definitions, and that he has fed his own definitions to Cindy, but the fact of the matter is that if you have to change the definitions of technical terms in science to score some rhetorical points, you've already lost the argument. These are scientific, technical terms with technical definitions, and unfortunately, Kent gave Cindy the wrong definitions. Okay. Um, natural selection selects from genes already available, okay? The gene code is in your makeup, and it only has certain options, okay? A finch gene code does not have the genes for a, a tail, does not have the genes for fur. It'll never get them. Natural selection only selects genes that are already there. This is true it cannot generate novel genetic variation. But let's see if we talk more about that. Finches do actually have a tail genes. That's because birds actually do have tails. They're just short and nubby, and the distal ends are fused together. But that's a tail nonetheless. That's why you can see birds move their tail feathers. As for fur, correct, they do not have genes for that. But that is quite in line with evolution. According to evolution, you cannot simply borrow traits from separate lineages at best, you can get superficially similar traits. For example, down feathers are superficially similar to hair and have some of the same functions, but they are pretty different in terms of growth and chemistry. In fact, if a bird could grow fur, that would be evidence of borrowing genes from mammals, which would have no evolutionary explanation and would be great evidence for a designer. Because we know from human designers that you can swap whole parts from one design to another. You don't have to only work with previous designs in the same lineage. Okay. Quickly, micro and macro, this is an example of macroevolution, where you turn from an amoeba to an invertebrate, to a fish, to a reptile, to a mammal, to a man. Well, I don't really like this picture because amoebas, jellyfish, and arthropods are all not ancestral to humans, but things that at least look like that fish, that early tetrapod, and that shrew-like animal are. But yes, ignoring the bottom three, the top four are basically correct and that would be macroevolution because it involves new species coming into existence. But the problem is that we don't have any way to know if a new kind has arrived, if such a thing were to happen. And since macroevolution is minimally speciation, a wolf, a fox, and a coyote evolving from a single common ancestor is macroevolution. Because you have the fox in genus Vulpes itself with several species, the wolf is Canis lupus, while the coyote is Canis latrans, so both of these pictures depict macroevolution. Just one depicts a whole lot more. Now, this isn't to say that you can't reject the picture on the left while accepting the one on the right, 
You certainly can, it's just that you can't use the idea of micro versus macro evolution to do so. That never happens. This is a fairy tale. Microevolution is small changes within a kind, okay? A wolf, a coyote, a fox, a dog might have a common descent. That doesn't seem too far-fetched to me. Okay, here's a bunch of dogs in the world. There's 300 breeds or something. And Dr. Hoven spoke to a dog breeder one time and she said, give me any mutt that's just a mixture of any mutt dog and she could get all these in a hundred years. I don't know how, but she and her family have been breeding dogs for many years. I want to say something. First, I'm trying to be as respectful as I can. I understand that this is not an interaction and that this video I'm looking at was recorded a while ago. Now, I really wish creationists would stop contrasting themselves with, quote, the atheists. The opponents of young earth creationists are not atheists. They're also not Christians, Buddhists, Jews, agnostics, etc. This isn't a fight between atheism and Christianity. This is a fight between a particular subsect of Christianity and the scientific consensus. That's why the guests I have on my channel are atheists, Christians, agnostics, etc. Second, you can't get all the variety in modern canids from just one breeding pair, unless you can generate new genetic variation. So setting aside the problems with timelines and inbreeding in such a story, if it is true that all modern canines descend from a single pair, but new genetic variety can't arise, then all canines couldn't have more than four variations per gene. But we know that isn't true. Canines have many more variations for many of their genes. So either Noah had to take a lot more than two, as he was commanded, or new genetic variation can arise and then be selected for. So the previous point about natural selection only selecting from what is already there can't be a problem for evolution without also being a problem for Noah's flood. Well, I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. I really hope this reaches Cindy and that she appreciates the effort, even if she isn't convinced by my arguments. Once again, I want to say thank you for watching. Please, if you haven't already, hit the like button, leave a comment, and if you haven't already subscribed, please do so, and remember to hit the bell icon, turn on notifications, so that way you're notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. Now I will just leave you with a word thanking my members and patrons. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a second to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 and above. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Res Instance. My channel members and patrons help make this channel possible, and without their support, this channel really wouldn't exist. If you would like to help support the channel as a member or patron, there are links in the description to both join the channel as well as join the Patreon. Patrons and members get mentioned in these credit scenes, as well as getting early access to my scripted videos, and if you pledge $10 or above, you can also get access to various 3D assets that I create for Blender, both for use in the channel, as well as just general giveaways to my supporters to help in any Blender projects they might have. If a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, then there is also a merch store linked in the description. And if none of that's right for you, please just like and subscribe because every like and subscription really helps the video out. Thank you.